Welcome to Prime Life. We call it Retirement 2.0. Leave each episode with tips and new ideas to help you navigate retirement in our new age. It's your time. Make it count. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended as medical, investment, or financial advice. We do not sponsor or endorse any of the individuals, companies, products, or services featured on this podcast. Any statements or opinions expressed are of the individual who makes them. We hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Prime Life Podcast. We're very excited to be here today speaking with a guest who is going to inform us, educate us, and entertain us. But before we get there, Joseph, how are you? Doing great, Laura. How about yourself? Oh, thank you. Have you been on any uh, recent adventures or have you stayed local? Oh, after my whirlwind trips, I've uh, stayed pretty local. Good thing, though. It's good to be home. Mary, how are you doing today? Off a wonderful Father's Day weekend. And can you do us the favor of introducing our guest today and uh, set us up for what we're going to be discussing? My pleasure, Laura. Thank you. Today we have Matt McCann. He holds the CLTC endorsement and is one of the nation's leading specialists in long-term care insurance products and long-term health care plans. Matt is licensed in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. He represents major insurance companies that offer long-term care planning products. Matt, just reading that alone is like, okay, so how did you fall into long-term care planning? What's your story? Tell us a little bit about your journey. Well, thank you. And first, thank you for having me on the show. Great to be here. I don't know about the entertaining part. I didn't know, do I need to sing, dance, anything like that? Not prepared, but I can come up with something. Um, I got into long-term health care, uh, unfortunately, through a personal experience. My mom at age 59 went through a series of health events, which led her to long-term health care for years and years and years. At the time, I was working for ABC. I was in radio since I was professionally since I was 15, although they didn't know I was 15 at the time. Facial hair in the 70s made me look older. There you go. Probably should shave it now and look younger, but you know how that goes, right? Um, and uh, so I was in, in Chicago working for ABC. Um, around the time that was happening, my mom got sick, ended up needing long-term health care, uh, Disney, who purchased ABC, decided to do something else with the radio station. And like happens often in, in radio and probably TV as well, and many industries uh, out the door I went. When I was looking for another job in radio, uh, I was looking at the Chicago Tribune, you know, when the one ads were in a newspaper. Okay, Laura, newspapers, you know what newspapers are? It's probably before your time. Uh, these paper things that had news from the previous day, that sort of thing. Uh, and they had huge one ads. And I was looking for, for something to do temporarily. And I saw no, numerous ads about long-term care insurance. And I don't want to sell insurance, but I know a little bit about that. I'll do that temporarily. So I've been doing this temporarily since 1998. Uh, and I still say temporarily because, you know, Someone may call and put me in a movie. You never know. It can happen. But uh, this is what I do, and I have a passion for it. And and now that I've been doing this for so many years, uh, my clients go through the claims process all the time. So I see both from the planning standpoint and then the end result and the impact, uh, the positive impact on people's finances and, more importantly, their families. Because long-term health care is really, first and foremost, about family. In my opinion, everything else is secondary. That's actually a really good place for us to start. We hear a lot about long-term health care, long-term care. It's been phrased, I guess, on the show. Can you have a little bit, of, what is it? Like, if, if I'm sitting here and it's my first time hearing this, or I'm not experienced in understanding what it is, Tell us a little bit about that and what LT, you know, long-term health care actually is. Certainly. When we talk about long-term health care, we're primarily talking about something we refer to as custodial care. 
there are certainly people that need ongoing skilled services, you know, the stereotypical medical attention in a nursing home. But that's a minority of what long-term health care ends up being. So most of it is this custodial care, which is best defined as really one of two different things, either help with what we call ADLs, activities of daily living, and the related IADLs, instrumental activities of daily living. Activities of daily living are all the things we kind of take for granted today. Uh, you know, eating, bathing, dressing, going to the bathroom, moving from point A to point B, that sort of thing that at some point, either due to a chronic illness, accident, or just the frailty of aging that we need help and assistance with. The IADLs are skills that we need to navigate life, you know, cooking, cleaning, going to the grocery store, paying bills, those types of things, which again, either due to illness, accident, or aging that we need help and assistance with. Um, most of that long-term care is custodial. And custodial care, which is what most people end up needing, is not paid for by tradition, traditional health insurance and other programs. So it's left up to either personal finances or families. And families are usually not prepared and certainly not trained to provide this type of care on a long-term care basis. I probably should add, uh, by federal definition, something is considered long-term if it lasts at least 90 days. So a sprained ankle, generally not going to be a long-term care situation. You sprain your ankle at age 80, however, it could lead to a long-term care situation. A good definition. And Matt, I, I know we have to have at least uh, a half a dozen Hollywood uh, scouts listening to this show. So you'll be getting that call any day now. You never know. Uh, you never know. Years ago, I, I worked in insurance myself and had the uh, privilege of selling some long-term care insurance. Maybe you could just explain the likelihood of someone needing a long-term care policy and why it's important to have it in place sooner than later. You know, like all insurance, you you need it before you you have to have it before you need it, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you can't call State Farm when your house is burning down and say, look, good neighbor, I need insurance now. And they'll say, you know, once you rebuild, give us a call and then maybe we'll give you a policy at that point. You know, the statistics are a funny thing. And I, I don't know who said that, you know, 52.3% of all statistics are made up on the spot. But I think for the most part, 62% of the time, they're probably right. Uh, although sometimes, you know, 48% of the time, they're just blowing smoke. The point is, it's either going to happen or it's not. Interesting enough, the Department of Health and Human Services says if you reach the age of 65, it's basically a 50-50 risk. Um, there are statistics used by the industry which talk about seven out of 10. That is not correct. That is referring to one study that was talking about one activity of daily living. Generally, you're not gonna need long-term health care if you can't do one activity of daily living. So if you're hearing something, reading something, or some professional says, oh, there's a seven out of 10 chance, eh, not true. It's either going to happen or it's not. Um, the older you get, the more likely you will need long-term health care. However, the problem is the advances in medical science have made it that things that used to kill us no longer do. Well, that's a good thing, right? It's hard to die. But if you don't die, you live. You can quote me on that. And if you don't die and you don't recover, the only thing left is long-term health care. So we have seen a very wider demographic of people needing long-term health care than ever before. Obviously, as you get older, that risk increases. But as far as a planning tool, you have to plan before you start having chronic illnesses or health issues that require care or make you more likely than average to need care. Most people start planning in their 40s and 50s. Most of my clients are in their 50s and early 60s. I think the average age is 53, 54 years old. That's not to say if you're older, you can't get a policy. If you have really good health, I think the oldest uh, person I got approved 
was a 79 year old guy. He was 79 going on 49 because he was on his fifth girlfriend who was 42 at the time. You get the idea. Okay. Um, so there are people with good health that are older, but I'll tell you, it costs a lot older or a lot more when you're older than it is when you're younger. Uh, but it is your good health today that gives you the opportunity to even think about planning. So that begs the question for me is when and how should someone? A very good question. <laughs> it, 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 first off, you have to determine whether this is appropriate. This is not a product that's appropriate for everyone. Um, Long-term healthcare planning involves both asset protection and reducing burden on family. Okay, most of us don't want to burden our spouse or our children or future grandchildren. There's a few of us that may want to, but for the most part, that's usually the case. Um, but not everyone has enough assets to make this appropriate. Um, there are various government programs, which we don't have to get into here, but uh, that are appropriate for some people, depending on their economics. I think one of the first questions when starting to plan is to find out whether or not this is appropriate. Um, there are suitability rules that licensed insurance agents and financial advisors must ask uh, in advance of uh, a, a discussion, something that I do all the time that is not universally done, even though the law requires it, but common sense requires it too. If, if you're going to look at, a, at a, a device to help protect assets, you have to have an idea of what you're protecting. In addition, there are 45 states that have partnership programs which provide additional dollar-for-dollar -dollar asset protection. There's numerous websites that have information on partnership and all that kind of uh, uh, specific material. We don't have to waste time here. Uh, one of the uh, websites I recommend is LTC News, which is www.ltcnews.com. Good uh, reference there. Uh, the federal government site, and they keep on changing the URL but it is currently www.acl.gov forward slash LTC. Um, so, and of course, a Google search can find you all sorts of stuff. Just keep in mind that anyone can put anything they want on the internet. It's not necessarily true. Um, but nonetheless, uh, once you determine that this might be appropriate, you need to find someone who's truly a specialist. There's not a lot of me out there, but there are. Um, and there are fewer people that are licensed nationwide. So your closest specialist may not be in your state. In some states, there's really no true specialists out there. That's not to say there's not insurance agents or financial advisors that can sell it. But you know, in my case, I process more claims than most insurance agents or financial advisors sell policies. That experience and access to all the top companies, uh, and probably just as important, understanding of the underwriting criteria and pricing is what uh, a, a specialist offers a, an individual. And that specialist, once you get a hold of them, will set up a meeting either in person, or in my case, I do it all virtually. Most specialists do it virtually. Uh, will ask very detailed questions about health, family history, and finances. Health is obvious. It is your good health that gives you the opportunity to think about it. And every insurance company has their own underwriting criteria. So, you know, Mary, company A may not be interested in anyone wearing glasses. Company B and C, D, they don't care. I obviously exaggerate glasses are fine, but... Uh, but my point is, that's why you have to ask the health questions. The financial questions, we have to know what we're trying to protect. Family history. Uh, many insurance companies will use a limited amount of family history as part of the underwriting process. In addition, knowing a little bit of family history also helps the, the specialist make recommendations. For example, uh, Joseph, if you say that your dad had Alzheimer's and you had two uncles and an aunt with Alzheimer's, while it may not mean you will, we may want to consider a plan that has a lot more benefit 
than you know Laura that doesn't have that history. But keep in mind that family history doesn't necessarily dictate anything uh, because medical science and lifestyle has changed over the years. You know, uh, when I first started, I was dealing with the greatest generation and then the Korean War generation. You know, some of the, the men I talked to, the last time they went to the doctor was their uh, exit physical out of the military. So today, most of us should go to a doctor and usually do on a regular basis, lab work, that sort of thing. Today, fewer people abuse uh, tobacco, you know, don't smoke, don't abuse alcohol, that sort of thing. All that influences previous generations and their health. And if people were dying earlier because of those types of lifestyle issues, today that's not likely you're going to live. And it's that longevity that's a big part of the equation. You mentioned the F word a few times. <clears throat> By that, I mean family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. I thought I, I messed up on my radio skills. Should have said never use that F word. Okay. No, you mentioned family a few times, and family is something that comes up a lot in these conversations because it's impact on family, it's family impact on the caregiver. It's it's a it's a giant weave of of family and and what that truly means. Talk to us a little bit about impacts on the family. And you've you've dealt with a lot of individuals. I'm sure that you've seen a, a multitude of situations and each one of them being unique. But have you seen anything float to the top, any kind of similarities or, or impact on family, especially when they're forced? And we'll get that answer after a brief word from our commercial sponsors. NASA is always working harder to be your carrier of choice. We offer insurance products that can help you meet your retirement goals, such as protecting your savings, securing lifetime income, or paying for health care costs. We're dedicated to providing best-in-class service and are keeping things simple, and we'll have your back. We have around 400,000 policyholders and contract holders and have been doing this for a long time, 170 years, but we remain humble enough to always try to improve. For more information, visit nfg.com. NASA insurance products are issued by NASA Life and Annuity Company of Hartford, Connecticut. NASA Life Insurance Company, East Greenbush, New York, or NASA Life Insurance Company of Kansas, Overland Park, Kansas. Subsidiaries of NASA Financial Group, products are not available in all areas. Policyholder counts are for all NASA companies as of September 30th, 2022, and are subject to change. Coverite is the first digital concierge health insurance platform focused on Medicare. Their mission is to make Medicare more transparent and accessible for America's 60 million Medicare beneficiaries. By simplifying a traditionally confusing and complex decision, Coverite delivers a simple, seamless, and hassle-free plan selection and enrollment experience. Try the Coverite platform and see for yourself why they've been referred to as the TurboTax for Medicare. Visit Coverite.com slash podcast to learn more. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, often the first time I get involved is when the family calls me saying, we need insurance for mom or dad. And that's usually not a good first sign. And then you start asking questions and you know, it's already too late for them. What happens often, happened in my family, is that an event happens, mom or dad needs care, there are no resources, meaning no insurance, to pay for it. And so there's usually one sibling that takes charge, either because no one else will or because everyone elects Laura to do that. And then now Laura gets to be caregiver. Forgetting the fact that Laura has a full-time job, may have a spouse and children. And how you juggle all those things is difficult at best, usually impossible, and has serious consequences on family and finances. And I'm talking about the family, meaning the caregiver's family 
and finances, not the care recipient. Obviously, that part is is obvious. Um, and when there's multiple siblings, there's infighting. This happens all the time because that one person, typically a daughter or daughter-in-law, becomes responsible for either providing care or managing care. And then often maybe a, a, a son will decide, you know, if there's no insurance involved, once professional care has to go in place, which asset to liquidate and what type of care that individual is going to get. And that's another issue is, no, in, in my case, would I care about my inheritance first? No. But there's a lot of people that look at their inheritance and over their future inheritance and say, well, we got to save some money here. We can, we can do this instead of that. Is that more appropriate than the other? If it costs, you, know, you start getting into a host of, of family matters and people don't have short memories. So years and decades after that care recipient has passed, that family strife continues. And that's not what anyone wants for their their children. There's no way. Uh, often a a wife will try to be a caregiver immediately, but generally the wife's in the age neighborhood of the care recipient. So, you know, can you imagine, you know, a 78-year-old woman trying to, you know, move their 82-year-old husband in and out of uh, bed into the bathroom? And no, no, not easily. And, and people don't want to talk about this. Financial advisors don't want to talk about it because it involves emotions. That's not what they do. I deal with emotions. I deal with health. And the ultimately, the cost of that care is on top of those emotions. And you have to bring reality to emotions because otherwise you get into crisis. And for too many families, not just in the United States, but worldwide. This is a global problem. I talk to people all across the world. Doesn't matter what economic system, whether it's you know, the Western world, the third world, whatever. We're all living longer. We all have families. And adult children usually are left holding the bag, trying to figure out what to do next. And it, it, it's sad, but if you wait till it's a crisis, then you're dealing with a crisis situation and trying to deal with a crisis is always more difficult than just planning ahead before the crisis. I want to talk a little bit about longevity for a second here. And this, this is like multiple questions in one. So hopefully you can get, grab them all. As we live older, as you just mentioned, as you know, people live in many many years longer than they did centuries ago, uh, decades ago. What role do, do you see the government playing in providing some of this care? And, and I know there's some states, you can talk maybe a little bit about the states that have long-term care taxes, uh, but what do you see the insurance companies doing to address this, right? So if, if their charts were X, you know, in 1980, or have they ad adjusted their charts and are they looking at the new science and taking into account things like epigenetics, right? Where they can tell to what some degree of certainty, how long someone's going to live and how their history of health has been. So I know there's a lot of it in there, but maybe you can. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the, the government started thinking about long-term health care decades and decades ago. You can find references in Congress going back to the fifties and sixties. Um, they seriously started thinking about it really in the um, 80s um, when they really finally determined that longevity was becoming a public policy issue. And of course, when you're in Washington or in state capitals, um, they tend to look, well, what's the government solution for this? And they really didn't have a government solution uh, at the time. 
there are government programs, which you can read about on the internet. If you're turning 65, you're going to run into some of those options. Um, but they're not solutions for long-term care. Um, very limited at, at best. Generally, a small amount of skilled care. So since most long-term health care ends up being custodial, that's an issue. Uh, in an attempt to address this, there were some tax incentives, uh, federal regulation on private long-term care insurance, and the establishment of the partnership program. The partnership program, which 45 states have active programs in place, uh, actually 44 with the 45th trying to put it all together, uh, provide incentives for individuals who purchase private long-term care insurance. Uh, you get additional dollar for dollar asset protection. The idea kind of makes common sense that if they incentivize people buying long term care insurance, uh, there'll be less pressure on the government. And it helped to some degree. But many people are unaware of the program, even though these states got money from the federal government to promote the partnership program. There's only a handful of states that use that money uh, and promote it. Uh, there are. I mean, Texas, for uh, example, is a good state, a good example of a state that that promotes it. So many people, unless they run into someone like myself, have no clue what the partnership program is. So that's one of the things I always talk about. But most people don't think about long term care until it's too late. So the state of Washington, starting July 1st of 2023, will now tax individuals age 18 and older that do not have a qualified long-term care policy in place. But if you don't already have a long-term care policy, you can't now get a policy to exempt yourself from this tax. They gave you a very small window to do that. So the question is, did they really want you to buy long-term care insurance? No, they wanted the money. And that money is going to programs that will help some people get long-term health care. There is huge problems in that. We don't have the we don't have the time to discuss all those problems. But there are a dozen other states. You know, California and New York are taxed. There's a tax we didn't think of, so they're in the process of designing their own plan. Now, to get away from the word tax, what they're actually doing is they're providing a benefit that you are forced to pay a premium. However, it is not insurance. And the benefit is virtually worthless. So I call it what it is. It's a tax. It will help government to some degree. But for most people, it is not a plan for long-term health care. Um, but in these other states, most of them will not have a run-up where you have time to get a policy to exempt yourself from the tax. As a matter of fact, um, in New York's legislation, uh, they will look back to the first of the year of the year the bill becomes law. So if the bill becomes law, let's say July 1st, if you didn't have a policy on January 1st of that year, you're SOL. You're paying the tax, even, you know, no time to, to you know, no heads up. Um, the point is, you don't get long-term care insurance really just to get out of a tax, although some very high-income people, that might be a motivation because that tax is on 100% of earned income for the rest of your life, from age 18 on. But in my mind, you, you, you get long-term care insurance or some kind of planning for long-term health care as part of a comprehensive retirement plan to give you access to quality care in the setting that you desire without creating a financial or an emotional or physical burden on your spouse or the rest of the family. That's the reason you do it. I have, have clients that are multi, multi-millionaires. If I told you their name, you would know them immediately. And of course, I've got, you know, retired or soon to be retired policemen, firemen, bakers, and whatever. Um, those two groups, the multi, you know, millionaire, star, athlete, or actor, actress, uh, CEO, what have you, have different concerns than the teacher or the baker or the plumber or what have you, other than they all have families that they love. 
the number one motivation is family. Now that multi multi millionaire, their money is typically all tied up. And there are tax complications to use self funding to pay for long term care. And then there's a control and independence issue. You're not going to make those decisions. You won't be able to make those decisions when you need care. So someone else will. So I, I, I remember a story, perhaps probably the richest client that I have. Again, someone you would know. Um, they're still living. And this is back when I saw people in person. So they had this huge mansion. Their, their maid opened the door and I went into this conference room in their home to, to meet with them to deliver their policy. They had already ap applied. And the couple walks in and I go over the policy with them and they're writing the first check. It was, I mean, this goes back a long time. So the check was like $2,800 for both of them. And he hands me the check. And I've never done this since, but I had to do it with this guy. And I go, why'd you do this? And he sat back in his chair, took his glasses off, which I knew I was had a problem at that point. And he goes, son, I didn't get to where I am today for making stupid business decisions. And he takes the check from me, holds it up and says, I spend more than this on a weekend of golf. Now, my long-term care problem is yours. Slides a check back, back to me. He certainly has a point. He could afford to buy an assisted living facility. He could afford 24-7 home care. He could write the check. Why would he want to? Why would he want to put his family through that? And that's part of the, the thing. I mean, money's important, don't get me wrong, but it is about family and the consequences of family that is the first and foremost part of long-term healthcare planning and, and that control and independence. You know, yes, it's a cash flow issue. We want to address the cash flow problem. And for many of us, it is a cash flow problem. But it's also a family issue. So we look at both family and finances when making recommendations and helping people plan. So Matt, as we kind of, you know, tie all this together and, and, and get to the end of our conversation, two things. What's the good news here? Is there good news, especially as we talk about longevity, people living longer, living healthier, perhaps, but still living longer, and they, they're going to have some health issues. That's inevitable. And then the other question that I have is, you know, what are a couple of steps someone should take um, that are baby steps, perhaps, but that can get them moving forward as they start to think about long-term health care? The good news is the advances in medical science do allow us to enjoy more good years. Okay. And of course, there's problems with that. Just, you know, problems with how you're going to fund a, a retirement. Forget long-term care. That's, that's something I don't do. But when you think about perhaps your parents or your parents' parents, you know, you work all your life, you, you retire. And then a year later, you're gone. Okay. What was it all about? Wasn't there a song about that? I think so. What was it all about? Okay. Now we, we, we retire and we have the ability and resources, or many of us do, to enjoy that retirement, uh, to, to travel, to do all the things that we put off because we were too busy at work. We have time to spend with our future or current grandchildren. Um, and so that is that is good news, okay? And every day you hear other advances in medical science. The problem with living longer is living longer. Aging happens. We cannot stop aging. There are scientists that believe that aging is a disease that eventually can be cured. And when you read the stuff, then there may be a point, but that's not going to impact any of us. 
maybe Laura, but the rest of us, you know, we're too far down the road uh, by the time they figure that out. Okay. So aging happens and no matter how healthy we are, no matter how many times we go to the doctor and eat right and do all those things, you can't stop aging because people need long-term health care just because of frailty. You can be, and I have people go on claim. There's nothing wrong with them. They're just old and frail. They still have their mind. There's no chronic health issue. They're just frail. So don't think of long-term care as, as something that you're going to have to live in a nursing home because you're sick and, and don't have a quality of life. When my mom was in the assisted living, she was the queen of trivia and she had, you know, they had games and all that was, she had a quality of life, even though she needed help with activities of daily living. And, and so people should not be afraid of a aging uh, or long-term care. Okay. Obviously you know, there's Alzheimer's and dementia and massive strokes and all that kind of stuff that happens. But, you know, when you talk to most people, they just, you know, they're old, they're breaking down because they're, they're old. Maybe there's a chronic health issue that's sped that up a little bit. Um, but without planning, long-term health care is expensive. Most care is delivered at home, adult daycare and assisted living, which is certainly less expensive than nursing homes. Uh, but nonetheless, no matter what the care is, it's expensive. And without planning, it's a crisis. Uh, with planning, the good news is there are several affordable options to address the cost and burdens of aging. But again, you can't call me the day after you get diagnosed with dementia. You got to do it sooner than later. And I personally, I would, depending on your financial situation, uh, do so, you know, mid to upper 40s through your 50s is the ideal time. Not to have too much fun with that comment, but you know, the day after you get diagnosed with dementia, you may not remember the call. Bing, bada, boom. Well, okay, you brought it up. So I'm in this in this client's house. This is again back when I saw people in person, and this number of years ago. And talking to this couple, the wife was all on board. She understood it. She took care of her mom. Blah 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 blah. My husband was like this. Yes. No, I don't know. Okay, the, the whole, whole time. Finally, as we got close to the end, which is the time everyone gets nervous because, you know, that's when someone's going to ask you to write a check, right? He goes, Matt, I have a long-term care plan. Now, this is the most he actually spoke for the entire hour that we were talking. And I go, well, Fred, what's your plan? Matt, this is my plan. So I looked at him and I go, Fred, it's your lucky day. What do you mean? I just got my Smith and Wesson license. I have samples in the trunk. Let me get one. The wife st almost fell out of her chair laughing. And he had a slight half grin. And I go, Fred, when you need care, Will you be able or remember you have the gun to do that? And do you really want your family to find you after you did that? And he said, uh, no. And then the wife says, let's apply and get this over with. So they did. So <laughs> there you go. People are amazing creatures. That's, that's what I'll say to that one. Um, so as we wrap at the top of our time here, Matt, my favorite question what is your why? You can wake up every day. You've had a, a, a variety of things in your life that you've accomplished thus far. Why do you keep doing the work that you do? Um, well, now doing it virtually, I can do it wearing a t-shirt and shorts. Uh, if I stand up, I am wearing the shorts. I won't stand up so you don't have to worry about that. But I, I, I don't have to see anyone anymore. Uh, and I did this long before COVID. I went virtual years and years and years ago. So I was uh, ahead of the COVID uh, working from home thing. Um, you know, it's very gratifying when I get the call. And there's two types of calls I get. 
the unsolicited call after they got their policy, they paid their premium, and I get the call or email that says, you know, thank you. We've been worrying about this for a while. You made it easy. We appreciate it. And the other is, unfortunately, at the time of claim. When the adult son or daughter, who I often never spoke with, calls and, and says thank you. That's why. Um, you know, I have a impact on other people, often without knowing the end result, because not everyone will contact me. I get the letter saying that when I'm claimed, because half the people will just deal directly with the insurance company, the other half will contact me. And that's why, I mean, you know, there's lots of jobs where people have impact, but often they don't know what that impact is. You know, they help make a product, uh, they, whatever it is, someone's enjoying that product, but they don't know that, that impact in this job, you get to know. And that's, you know, I wish I wish that was, I'm sorry. I wish that was available for my parents prior to, to what happened. It's, it's important work and it's, it's very impactful. Um, you know, listeners of the, the show have been listening for grandparents and, and being the, the, and it it means the world, and it means the difference uh, to not only the person receiving the care, but as you said, earlier, the family who surrounds that individual. So it's it's extremely important. We're thankful for you joining us today to have this conversation to educate, entertain, and uh, and share more about how how people can can learn more and access these resources. And in a conversation, we did talk about different websites. We will put those in the show notes so people can learn more. But in the meantime, Matt, if they want to um, reach out to you, learn more about your business, what is the best way that they can find you? Um, well, they can do an internet search. I'm all over the internet. Um, or go to my website, The the and you'll have it posted. But if you just type in radioltc.com, that will take you right to the website instead of trying to spell my name, M-C-C-A-N-N. Uh, so it's radioltc.com. All my contact information is there. I also, of course, have a Twitter feed and a Facebook feed and all that kind of stuff there. But I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, or you might find my you know, face in the post office. Hopefully you won't see that there. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, I look forward to talking to anyone who wants to speak. We appreciate your time today, Mary Joseph. Thank you both very much. And we invite you all to please tune in to another episode of the Prime Life Podcast. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Remember to subscribe to the Prime Life Podcast anywhere you find podcasts. You can find all of our episodes, contact information, and more on our website, primelifepodcast.com. Stay connected with us. Follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok.